upon which God and Lucifer wage war for men's souls, my friends, and they are right. Let the contest begin! This is the world of competitive eating. Today we're looking into the world of competitive eating and speed eating, in which the goal is to basically eat as much as you can as fast as you can, or to eat a certain amount as fast as you can. We all know what it's like to occasionally eat too much or to treat ourselves to something extremely high in sugar, salt, or fat. Something that's probably not the healthiest choice and feel our bodies start to protest. We may feel lethargic, groggy, nauseous, or simply very, very, very full. However, competitive eaters literally train themselves to push past the body's limits to ingest amounts of food beyond what is physically possible for an average human stomach to fit. This sport, and yes, it is being considered a sport, takes overindulgence to a whole nother level. Today we'll be discussing all things competitive eating, the training, how they do it and manage to stay in shape, the strategies and the risks in hopes of getting a better understanding of the toll it can take on a person's health. Let's get into it. Whoo, buddy. So I can eat about 17 pounds, which is like the equivalent of what, two newborn babies? First, we're gonna begin with a bit of history. As pointed out by journalist Claire Sadath in a Time News article, the idea of speed eating can be traced back centuries, believe it or not. Face stuffing was mentioned in 13th century Norse mythology in a tale in which the god Loki and his servant face off in an eating contest. Journalist for NPR and author of Horseman of the Esophagus, Jason Fagoni, states there are a lot of different cultures that have kind of invented eating contests independently at different points in history. Organized competitive eating, however, is fairly new. According to Major League Eating, which is the sports governing body, its American roots began in 1916 at the Coney Island 4th of July hot dog eating contest held by Nathan's Famous Hot Dogs, in which four immigrants competed to determine who was the most patriotic. Since then, eating contests have become somewhat synonymous with American Independence Day celebrations. However, it was only in the mid 1990s when two brothers, George and Richard Shea, took over Nathan's publicity that caused the sport to gain real legitimacy. As audiences grew, so did the prize money, so did the records, and subsequently, so did the amounts of food needing to be consumed to set a new one. After initially gaining popularity in North America, speed eating as a competitive sport has spread around the world, leading to the development of the International Federation of Competitive Eating, which organizes, promotes, and publicizes all sorts of events. You've got to be kidding me. There was a game-changing moment in the history of the sport in 2001 at the annual 4th of July event. A young man named Takeru Koyabashi, five foot eight and 135 pounds, came to America to compete in the hot dog contest. Fogoni explains, he was different from everyone who came before him. He wasn't big, he looked very healthy, he didn't have a jokey nickname. It turned out that he had been training for the contest as if it were a real sport. He was innovative, he came with the strategy. Instead of just shoving the hot dogs in and hoping for the best, he would snap them in half and dunk them in water. He demolished the previous record, which was at that point 25 hot dogs in 12 minutes, which Kobayashi almost outdid in three minutes, doubling that amount by the final buzzer. After that performance, companies saw the financial potential in the sport. ESPN started broadcasting it. And as for the other competitors, they now understood the actual athleticism involved. He's going down. One of us will win. Guaranteed. I can't guarantee anything. <laughs> what was a sport previously dominated by hefty barbecuing Americans now required skill and precision. People started taking it seriously. No more joking around, they wanted to win. My game plan is eat fast, win. Gustatory athletes or gurgitators, like other athletes, train for the game. I mean, if you're trying to eat 20,000 calories in 10 minutes, you'd likely have to. 
Sure, some speed eaters may have been born with a natural ability to eat more, but most of the high level competitors treat this as they would any other sport. They hone their skills. A study in the American Journal of Rankinology conducted by Mark Levine et al. on the truth and consequences of competitive eating assessed a world-class champion during a speed eating test. What they found was that unlike the control subject, the speed eater had noticeably altered gastric physiology, which allowed his stomach to quickly expand to hold a lot of food, making his upper abdomen bulge. Discussions with this champ echo what most competitive eaters also say. It takes prolonged and intensive training to get a stomach to do that, to build up a tolerance. I think it's just something that you, you deal with training is, is gradual, so you build up to more and more over time. Basically, forcing themselves to consume larger and larger amounts despite the sensation of fullness, overcoming the body's limits to exercising extreme willpower and discipline, and adapting the stomach to withstand the stresses of competition. We will get to the psychological aspect of it a bit later, but for now, let's focus on the stomach. Gastric accommodation is a natural process that happens in a person's body when they're eating. As explained on Seeker, a science-based channel formerly owned by Discovery. It's a way the body anticipates a meal. Saliva builds up in the mouth and the stomach is bombarded with acid and enzymes that help in the digestion process. All bodies do this. It basically readies the stomach to receive food. As explained in the scientific journal, Gut, it relaxes the stomach muscles and allows the stomach to stretch as to temporarily store ingested food before controlled release into the intestines. This is why a stomach can stretch up to far beyond its normal fasting state while eating, which is known as gastric distension. Then return to its original size once the food passes through the digestive tract, as pointed out by registered dietitian Ariane Lang. I can barely see you guys over my mountainous stomach. Oh, this is embarrassing. However, this is usually paired with other physiological mechanisms. In a sense, safety mechanisms that alert satiety. Hormone signals such as leptin, ghrelin, cholecystokinin, and peptide YY are released from the gut and adipose tissue and sent to the brain. Nerve impulses travel through the stomach and intestines to the brain as well. Stretch receptors in the stomach and intestines detect physical distension caused by food intake and are activated and signal the brain. Nutrients, particularly glucose and amino acids from the food digested and absorbed enter the bloodstream and affect hormonal and neural signaling pathways. All of these bodily processes work together to regulate food intake, maintain energy balance and prevent overeating. They basically let the brain know, um, hey, I'm done eating for now, bro. This is the signal that competitive eaters teach their bodies to ignore <laughs> and push beyond. A lot of people criticize me and say I abuse my body, but really I'm really in tune with my body and I'm able to make it do things, push it to incredible limits. Not only do they simply practice this by partaking in various food challenges, but they train their stomach on their off days as well. Some ingest vast amounts of low calorie foods, such as cabbage, to stretch their stomach and get themselves used to the feeling of fullness. Others do what's called water loading, which is the same idea, but without any added calories. There's two ways to do it. One is say you go to a buffet and just eat, eat vast amounts of food. While it's fun to do that, it's not fun to process all that food afterwards. And it's really hard to compare one day to the next. The food's always different. So I chose to train with water, which is very, very dangerous but there was no calories in it. Kobayashi once said in a Fox News interview that he primes his stomach by drinking three gallons of water in 90 seconds. His mantra is mind over matter, encouraging those looking to follow in his footsteps to think creatively, acknowledging that everyone has a different body and to find what works for them. <laughs> However you train it, the goal is the same, overcome the feeling of fullness. It should also be noted that it takes time for food to digest, so when it is eaten so quickly, the body may not even have a chance to recognize that it is full before the meal is finished. Either way, competitive eaters familiarize themselves with the feeling so that they can essentially desensitize themselves to it. Now, 
You may be wondering, how can people who intentionally overeat stay in shape? In a Channel 4 documentary on the sport, professional eater Leah Schuttkeever explains. The misconception is that competitive eaters are these massive human beings and they'll just come in like giants. Most competitive eaters are actually relatively thin. In an article written by Roger Collier, published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, he brings up the belt of fat theory, which posits that belly fat restricts the stomach's ability to expand. Therefore, those who take the sport more seriously are more aware than you think about their body composition. Most remain fit through exercise and controlling calories on the off days. Some even fast before and after an event. Good, young, competitive eaters now, you have to maintain a good level of fitness. The day after a challenge, I will lower what I eat. I've got a really active lifestyle and I kind of need the calories. I'm in the gym seven days a week, mainly just lifting weights. From my research into this topic, it seems that most would agree. However, there's a bit more to it than just going to the gym. When it comes to maintaining his weight, professional eater Adam Moran, also known as Beard vs. Food, shares his secret with us in the video. When it comes to gaining weight or losing weight is the amount of calories you consume over time. When it comes to weight management, it is largely about caloric input. If you consume less than your daily intake chronically and consistently, you lose weight and vice versa. Emphasis on chronically and consistently. Purely for body composition purposes, forget health, practicality, forget the way it makes you feel for a second, can occasionally binge, but still stay in shape. He seems to be quite knowledgeable about the body, fitness and nutrition, and seems to be approaching this sport from a pretty safe and informed and healthy standpoint. Or at least as much as one can be in a sport that has little to no health benefit whatsoever. I'm a real nerd for like how the human body works to energy turnover and all that stuff. The way he does it is pretty simple. Track your calories, Take note of what you eat and weigh yourself at the same time every day. Do this over a period of time because your daily weight can fluctuate. From doing this, you will be able to get a sense of your daily requirements for weight maintenance. Although I'm fairly small, I weigh 158 pounds, I'm fairly active, I follow a pretty rigorous strength training program. He explains that since most of the mass on his body is muscle, in order to sustain his weight, activity level and bodily functions, his daily caloric intake is approximately 3000 calories. Obviously, this varies based on the individual's physiology and lifestyle habits. Personal trainer James Smith watched Adam's video and explained his method in a video of his own. Once you've got this amount, times that by seven. You're much better working off to a weekly amount of calories that you're gonna aim for because not all of our days are the same. Once you have the weekly total, a competitive eater essentially deducts their calorie binge or cheat meal from that. He explains that you can't have your cake and eat it too. You have to balance the books. Because he calculates and methodically moves around calories throughout the week to make it work for him. Is that they don't know if they're eating too much or too little. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So if you wanted to binge 8,000 calories and still lose weight, it's technically possible. It may not be healthy, but it's possible. If your daily intake is 3,000, then your weekly intake is 21,000. Two plus two is four, minus one, that's three, quick maths. If you binge 8,000 one day, then you've allotted 13,000 for the rest of the week, which works itself out to roughly 2,100 daily. If you binge 8,000 one day, then you're allotted 13,000 for the rest of the week, which works itself out to roughly 2,100 per day. Theoretically, all you would have to do is eat slightly less, say 2,000 to lose weight. However, as Adam points out, your body's always striving for homeostasis. It can upregulate or downregulate metabolism depending on how much you're eating and what your activity level is. So having a caloric deficit of a few hundred per week probably wouldn't do much in terms of weight loss. Therefore, you'd still have to make a much larger dent in your caloric intake, which is difficult when you're even occasionally going so overboard. As mentioned, the body wants balance, and not only for your weight's sake, but for your overall health. 
Food simply can't be reduced to calories, as in the 500 calories you consume in a cheeseburger aren't the same as the 500 you may consume in a salad with chicken on top. It's also about food quality, because it is the nutrients in the food that fuels us and supports our body processes. Our body always has ongoing processes, whether it's muscle repair, skin regeneration, nail growth, all of these little things. Many of these meals are either highly processed, high sugar, high carb, high sodium, high fat, or all of the above. Rarely do you see a competitive eater gorging on a plate of vegetables. What are you doing? You're just eating this by yourself? What happened to your whole team? And as James goes on to explain, the high amount of calories being consumed for the low amount of nutrients is not the best trade-off. Eating things like fast food regularly can leave you feeling lethargic and weak. Though, if your diet consists mainly of that, you may not even notice your energy levels are low. However, if you swing back and forth from binging to dieting, your energy levels would likely be inconsistent. On the days when I'm not doing something stupid with food, I'm eating really nutrient-dense food, stuff that's good for you, right? So even though he does eat fairly healthily on his off days, Adam said it himself, there's highs and lows, peaks in energy and <laughs> crashes. This is not the most efficient way to eat. I'm not by any means advocating this as the best way to consume your food on a daily basis. He goes on to say that for athletes, basically any other type of athlete, this routine probably isn't great. Many athletes do have cheat meals, but in terms of what digesting that does to your energy and your ability to train and perform consistently, a more sustainable diet is best. However, if you do happen to binge, it's not going to completely destroy your health. Many people are concerned after they overeat because they notice weight gain when they step on the scale the next day. However, not all of that weight you gain is fat, and not all of it will be turned to fat either. The weight that you gain is, for the most part, transient. It's going to leave you naturally as soon as you go back to eating the way you would normally. Again, James and Adam point out a few important things in their videos. Not only does the actual food consumed weigh a significant amount, but because these foods are likely high in sodium and carbohydrate, your body will store glucose as glycogen in your muscles, which will make you heavier, and it will hold on to sodium, which will cause you to retain water, which will make you puffy, not to mention the actual water weight itself. The excess water retention you're gonna get. So if you eat one gram of carbohydrate, you're gonna hold on to four grams pretty much of water. And this may even be more noticeable for those who do generally eat clean because the body will have difficulty depositing the excess calories. But as the name transient weight suggests, it will go away once you resume a regular diet. It's not something to be worried about. Remember, your health is about consistent habits, be them positive or negative. However, while competitive eaters do seem to be making it in a regimented way, they are making this seesaw binge diet routine a lifestyle habit. The study I mentioned earlier gives this analogy. A top competitive speed eater may be compared with a predatory carnivore that periodically gorges itself on its kills, ingesting massive amounts of food for sustenance until it captures another prey days or even weeks later. Like I said, these athletes take this seriously. They go into a competition with that level of focus and determination to win. They come prepared, yo. Show you a couple of secret, secret professional eat stretches. <laughs> Oh, he's got to stretch out the old abdominal cavity, you know. There are many strategies in their arsenal. These include drinking warm water to help it go down easier, or... I, I drink a lot of fizzy beverages because that helps with digestion. So there's odd things like that that you can do to help things go smoother. So I'm just going to get a drink from the fridge. Is that okay? Just going to get something fizzy. Is there any chance I could get um, like a Diet Coke or Coke Zero or something like that? So liquids that can act as a food lube, as Adam puts it, hey, yo. are important for it to pass smoothly through the esophagus and into the stomach. Hey, yo. Some even dunk the actual food into juice or lemonade to help it dissolve. Those are pretty basic, but there are others that give you a better sense that you're dealing with top level competitors. If I crush and take one bite, I'm able to swallow and then take another bite at the same time. They want to get it down as fast as possible, so it's no surprise that sometimes they don't really chew their food very much, if at all. 
Peter Duodswell is an old school competitive eater who claims he is a medical anomaly because he has two gullets. He harps on modern competitive eaters because they're typically messy when they eat. To me, that is eating fast and that is clean. This is interesting because, according to him, the reason he doesn't have to slam and cram food into his mouth is because he's able to keep his gullet open and just pour it down. Medically, this is unlikely, so to understand why, let's look at the esophagus. The bunch of muscle that sits in a ring that makes sure that it's closed unless we tell that muscle to relax so we can pass food along. As explained in this Khan Academy video, the esophagus is the passageway from the upper sphincter to the lower sphincter, which is basically the diaphragm. The esophagus can be seen as having three parts. The upper part being skeletal muscle, the middle being the mix of skeletal and smooth muscle, and the lower part being smooth muscle. And as it moves from skeletal to smooth, it moves from being under voluntary control to not. That is to say, you hypothetically may be able to voluntarily relax the muscle to hold your upper esophageal sphincter open, but this is probably very hard to do and extremely risky. So obviously, this is not recommended, and even in Peter's rare case, I'm not sure that's what is actually happening. I'm just a medical freak. Whether an eater swallows food whole or just takes gigantic bites, the food is likely struggling to actually pass through the esophagus, which is why it can come back up. And even if it does make it down, may have problems being digested. But we will get into the risks of that in a bit. For now, let's address some more eating strategies. To avoid being overwhelmed by the entire meal, many take it in steps. Leah has a strategy and she sticks to it. Divide and conquer. Take it periodically and just smash for each stage. Many eaters approach their meal systematically. For example. Maybe squares was a good idea after all. Help psychologically, I think. That's going to be the most tasty part because that's got all the toppings on. So I'm going to put that there, eat a few of these patties underneath. Yeah, good call. Give me something to look forward to at the end. It makes sense that you save the best for last so that you can push through to the end. But you'd think that at that point of being full, which again may not be something they feel, it'd be difficult to even enjoy it. Who here has gone to all you can eat sushi and ate more than your stomach could handle and felt sick? At that point, even if you were to try and give me a delicious, fresh, mouth-watering piece of shrimp tempura, my eyes would start to water. But hey, <laughs> that's why these guys are athletes, no? It's getting hard. Not really. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, it's getting hard. But how do you really feel, Kurt? Generally, I'm pretty good. I could honestly do a burger right now. Come on. No, honestly, I could go for a burger. Joey Chestnut, who is the reigning champ of Nathan's 4th of July hot dog eating contest, also mentions the benefit of building up tolerance. In a sense, expanding your comfort zone by eating within your comfort zone. I'm still amazed at how good the Big Mac still tasted. It's so much easier to eat a food that you're familiar with and your body just already knows. He explains that restaurant challenges may be more difficult because even if the food is good, your body isn't used to it. It's easier to power through when you know what to expect. Most, if not all of the competitors I researched mentioned getting into a rhythm. And like you can see I'd like to do the same thing over and over again. When I grab the burger, I take off the lettuce, and stack the box. I'm really good at so just getting in that rhythm. So it's easier to push yourself when you have a pattern because the action becomes automatic, which echoes the sentiments of many top performing athletes across sports. However, this state of mind isn't necessarily very healthy when the thing you're locked in on isn't at all healthy. Nevertheless, getting into the zone is what high level competition is all about. Some seem to benefit from being methodical, while others are more free flowing. As Adam puts it, sometimes strategy can be fiddly. That's because you have to be able to present enough to adapt and be flexible. Still, all competitors agree that mastery of the psychological component of the game is crucial. Over 80% is psychological. Deep breaths. I see the win. I see the finish line. I'll just go, okay, I'm ready. Leah explains that when she is eating, she doesn't hear anything from the sidelines. She doesn't smell or taste. Her brain is basically mush. She's strictly 
Inhaling food. It's basically an eating trance. Overthink anything, you slow down. It just takes one minute, sheer pressure, concentration, nothing can mess in the head. The Seeker video points out something interesting. The possibility of overriding your stomach with your brain. To understand this, let's look at our enteric nervous system, or our gut brain. It's made up of more than 100 million nerve cells that line the walls of our digestive tract, and it's there to keep food moving and to communicate problems. As he explains, the bacteria living down there share two-way communication with the brain, aka the brain and gut are intimately connected. We know that stress can suppress gut function, so maybe eaters are able to tap into that connection in the opposite way. Basically, by making the desire to win and the anticipation of reward, fuel the desire to keep eating, or at least outweigh the desire to stop. In other words, can the competitors literally taste the win? The apprehension before puts you into a little hole, <laughs> and then when you do it and you win, it's the best feeling. It's worth mentioning that some studies using various techniques found a dopaminergic altered state or in other words, changes in a person's dopamine levels associated with binge eating, though the direction of these changes is unclear. That said, it would be an interesting area of research. Regardless of the strategies, there are some hurdles that even the focused eaters have to jump over to make it to the finish line. Things like flavor fatigue, which means getting bored of eating so much of the same food. Another one is meat sweats. Meat sweats kicking in. Uh-huh, let's be hearty. Dr. James Grant, who is the Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, discusses what's called temperic theory. And that's when you eat a lot of meat, the energy in our body requires us to break down these proteins, we end up raising our body temperatures. So yeah, when you eat, your body turns food into energy through metabolism. This process creates heat, making you feel warmer. Exercise and digesting food both increase your metabolic rate, causing your body to sweat to cool down. Protein-rich foods like meat require more energy to digest compared to carbohydrates. As exercise psychologist Dr. Helen Kalias points out, 20 to 30% of total calories in protein eaten go to digesting it, versus 5 to 10% for carbs and 0 to 3% for fats. However, Dr. Grant points out that there are other factors while eating that make us sweat more, such as the temperature outside, that is to say, <laughs> barbecue weather, if the food is spicy or processed, high in sugar, or if you're also consuming caffeine or alcohol, etc. So if you're consistently sweating while you're eating, it may be a sign that your diet is just a little bit out of whack. So sweating may be one indication that the diet being consumed is difficult for the body to process, but there are some other complications that come from eating like this, both in terms of portion size and nutritional value. Let's begin with the more immediate health risks. Many eaters complain about jaw pain. My jaw's already in a lot of pain. In an interview with dentist Dr. Gary Lauder, he explains that excessive chewing associated with competitive eating may lead to inflammation in the jaw joints, potentially resulting in jaw problems such as temporomandibular disorder, or TMD meaning the joints, muscles, and ligaments around your lower jaw aren't working properly. Another concern related to portions, and one of the biggest concerns, is choking. In an interview, Adam said that the dangers of his sport mainly come from mechanical issues, rather than long-term health issues, and that this is exacerbated in competitions, in comparison to restaurant challenges. Most of his YouTube videos, he's eating at a speed of what may seem fast to us, but is, as he describes it, a leisurely pace. Whereas in a contest, and you're trying to win money or prizes, then yeah, you're basically choking for 10 minutes and it's whether or not you can, can handle it, you know? We briefly mentioned the structure of the esophagus, but an important thing to understand is a digestive process within the esophagus called peristalsis, which is basically the wave-like propulsion of food. Let's return to Khan Academy's helpful video. The contraction of the esophagus at one point up here, by doing that, it relaxes down here. Exactly. And by doing so in that manner, food can move downwards towards the stomach. That means that if you have 
a bolus of food, it's more inclined to move this way. This presupposes that food is adequately chewed, compressed into a bolus, and mixed with mucus so that it is lubricated and in an efficient shape to pass through the passageway. Dry food swallowed in gigantic chunks with rough edges can hinder the peristalsis process, which can lead to <coughs> choking. And choking can lead to death, bro. In April 2017, Caitlin Nelson, a 20-year-old student at Sacred Heart University in Connecticut, tragically lost her life after choking on a pancake during an eating contest. So it's always safest to not rush and to chew your food. Oddly though, that is what it sounds like when Joey eats. Another related risk associated with the esophagus is what's called a Mallory Weiss tear which involves splitting open and bleeding of the inner lining of the esophagus where the lower esophagus meets the stomach. According to the Cleveland Clinic, this occurs because of pressure on the abdomen, which scientists believe forces the stomach contents into the esophagus, causing these tears. This can also lead to aspiration pneumonia, especially if the stomach contents enter the airways, increasing the risk of lung infection. A less common, but even more severe risk is Boerhaave syndrome, which is a full thickness tear of the esophageal wall, again, due to sudden rise in pressure, which can lead to the leakage of stomach contents into surrounding chest cavity. It's considered a medical emergency in which a surgical treatment is required because it can lead to serious complications such as mediastinitis or an inflammation of the chest cavity between the lungs or sepsis, a blood infection. Both of these issues are typically brought about by forceful vomiting, but can occur during bouts of binge eating as well. So let's say the food makes it to the stomach safely. Let's discuss risks associated with its extreme stretch. As host of Sports Science on ESPN, John Brankus puts it, eaters can go from zero to nine months pregnant in 10 minutes flat. Your stomach expands and actually does push all of your organs out of the way. The stress you're putting your body under forces the abdomen to expand to compensate, which can cause discomfort, bloating, and sometimes pain. In a case study performed by Tian Lim et al., a competitive eater presented to the emergency department and the CT scan revealed a distended stomach and duodenum filled with food, causing compression of the pancreas and displacement of the bowels. The distended stomach compressing the duodenum likely caused the acute pancreatitis and acute kidney injury also seen on the scan. Kobayashi told reporters that his stomach expands so vastly that it pushes up against his lung. In other cases, gastric distension can lead to more serious complications such as vomiting, difficulty breathing, or even rupture of the stomach wall or gastric perforation. This is similar to the issue we just mentioned with the esophagus. It's a hole in the stomach wall that can leak stomach contents into the abdominal cavity, causing complications such as infection, inflammation, and abdominal pain. In the Channel 4 documentary, Dr. Helen the Wall tries to reason with a competitive eater. It feels like it's gonna blow It literally minute. does feel like it's gonna burst. And that's what we mean by gastric perforation. Yeah. We mean the stomach physically bursting. Another possible issue that can happen with the stomach is gastric paralysis, otherwise known as gastroparesis or gastric stasis, which means the stomach muscles are unable to contract and there is delayed gastric emptying. Remember the term esophageal peristalsis I mentioned earlier? Well, there is also gastric peristalsis. Again, it refers to coordinated and muscular contractions that occur this time within the stomach to mix and propel contents forward through the digestive system. This rhythmic movement is essential for breaking down food, mixing it with digestive juices, and moving it along the gastrointestinal tract. However, if those muscles become paralyzed, then the food can't move. According to John Hopkins Medicine, this can possibly result in the formation of a bezoar, meaning your undigested food turns into a solid mass within your stomach, which obviously can block your stomach, leading to nausea and vomiting and further prevention of any food passing through to the small intestine. However, the competitive eater featured in Roger Collier's article I mentioned earlier states that the part of competitive eating that may be most risky isn't the competition. It's a very dangerous thing to train for. We've discussed the method of water loading, but not the risk involved in it yet. Now, 
Water is definitely healthy, but water intoxication is actually a thing. Chugging water can dilute the electrolytes in the body enough to cause death. When sodium levels fall below certain levels, usually below 120 millimoles per liter, but more severely below 110 millimoles per liter, it can cause neurological symptoms. These symptoms worsen as sodium levels continue to drop, progressing from confusion to drowsiness and eventually coma. Again, let me highlight how essential it is to maintain the delicate balance of the body, even with things like water. Though there haven't been very many long-term studies on the effects of competitive eating, doctors are able to give an educated guess. For example, health-related issues from excessive amounts of processed food, in particular high sodium food. Excess sodium in your blood causes more water to enter your blood vessels, increasing blood volume and raising blood pressure. This extra workload strains the heart as it pumps more blood throughout the body, risking heart failure. One of the main long-term risks is obesity. Anthony Jung and Prasanna Tati's book, Physiology, Obesity, Neurohormonal Appetite and Satiety Control, explains that the feelings of appetite and satiety involve complex interactions between hormones from the gastrointestinal tract to the hypothalamus and subsequent feedback. Together, ghrelin and leptin signals regulate our sensations of hunger and satiety by sending signals to different nuclei within the hypothalamus for food intake. An imbalance or dysregulation of these hormones may drastically affect the body's energy homeostasis. When we consistently push past the feelings of fullness, we are risking disruption of our hormones. And in doing so, we subsequently risk not only obesity, but metabolic syndrome and other digestive disorders as well. Over time, maybe if you lose the willpower, your lifestyle changes, that you're unable to hold back. Our relationship with food is psychological as well as physical. If you're not highly mentally disciplined, it would be incredibly easy for somebody to get carried away, develop eating disorders. That's another risk. In a Fox News article, Dr. Stephen Crawford, co-director at the Center for Eating Disorders at Shepherd Pratt, said, it's a disordered pattern of eating that can put a genetically vulnerable person at high risk for developing an eating disorder. And he even links it to laxative abuse. Therefore, in terms of habit forming, because competitive speed eaters' interactions with food are almost consistently inconsistent, meaning they are binging then dieting, it's always going up and down in terms of both sheer volume and nutrient intake. They risk developing a deeply unhealthy relationship with food. As well-being strategist Dr. David Nico puts it, they are disrupting the mind-body balance. You have to really work hard if you're gonna be able to eat all that food. I'm usually doing between three to four hours of actual training and that's endurance training. I'll say it one more time for the people in the back. The body is always seeking homeostasis and balance. Since these speed eaters have minimal practice with a sustainable balanced diet, when the competition is over, will they even know how to eat healthily? My current GP said, professionally, I've got to tell you, do not do this. But professionally, I've got to tell a UFC fighter not to do this. Well, they warn for good reason. From everything I just laid out, there do seem to be risks involved. Now, as we've seen, top level competitors like Adam do seem to be pretty health conscious. You don't get anything if you finish it, but um, you push you get people a high off, five. you get high five. Yeah, push, and 20,000 calories on your belly. He said he doesn't really get sick because he's built up such a tolerance for the bodily stress. If anything, he'll maybe feel a headache a few days after only because he hasn't eaten much since the challenge. However, even he's had a few situations where the food gave him a run for his money. I can't move, I can't move. <laughs> and they, they were just in cramp, I couldn't walk because of all the sugar. But when it comes to sports, rookie Kyle Gibson says it like this. To be the best at anything, you've got to be, be prepared to put yourself through a lot. Most athletes have to take certain risks to get to where they are. Most, if not all speed eaters are driven by one thing, the competition. They are very determined to break records and be the best. The desire to win is nothing new in the arena of competitive sport. Some may even argue it is the point. We just broke a Guinness World Record. I'm quite a competitive person. I don't like losing. It's fun to say that I'm the best at something in my country, so I might not be as good as Cristiano Ronaldo, but best in England, right? Competitive eater Gideon Oji had this to say while co-hosting NPR's live coverage of an eating event. 
I played college basketball at the highest level, and this by far is the most challenging thing, just because you're fighting against your body. Being like, stop doing that to me, and you have to keep going for the competition. That's what drives me. It's very challenging, very spiritual for me. However, though there is skill involved, unlike most sports, competitive eating doesn't seem to have any inherent health benefit whatsoever, bro. Even in something like bodybuilding, which involves people pushing themselves to the extreme and often abusing substances to achieve such extraordinary physiques, the goal is meant to be, even if it is distorted by some, to achieve the pinnacle of the human body. Excellence in form. I got like a turtle shell of abs now. <laughs> Competitive eating doesn't just push to the extreme, it starts at the extreme. It doesn't just tip the balance, it's based on imbalance. The speed eating phenomenon seems to have somewhat of a social media effect. Similarly to how social media rewards extreme behavior because we as consumers of media view it, the bar just keeps getting raised and then people need to do more and more outrageous things to keep people's attention and secure the win and the bragging rights. I, I don't want to sound overly confident or cocky or anything like that, but when it comes to eating, it's my thing, right? Doesn't matter how good somebody gets, I'll still be better. One thing I found interesting while doing research for this video is that in the Channel 4 documentary, two thirds of the competitive eaters featured had challenging relationships with food and their weight as children. I was made very aware that I was more overweight than a normal girl, and then it made me look at myself differently. When I was growing up, I always struggled with my weight. I was known as that kind of chubby kid. There were certain bullying moments in my life that I can remember. Kyle goes on to say that eating was a way to make himself feel better, which I'm sure is understandable for many people, regardless of their size. Though they note different catalyzing experiences, for Leah, it was the discovery of bodybuilding, and for Kyle, an injury. Both stated that it was through self-discipline and lifestyle changes that they transformed their body and learned the value of an active lifestyle. However, I wonder if their relationship with food now as a competitive eater could be a way of reframing their experience from something they once may have felt shame about, that is to say, overeating, to being something that they could become skilled in and successful at. Or maybe it's just a way for them to still enjoy junk foods, but in moderation, now that they are relatively healthy and active. Though I do have to say that a giant binge can't really be considered moderate. However, I can't generalize about these theories and my degree is not in psychology. I just thought it worth mentioning. I can say, however, that these competitive eaters see value in their skills. And given the prize money involved in these competitions and the views eating challenges get on the internet, the public seems to value it as well. One could argue, however, that being good at something that isn't good for you isn't necessarily a good thing. Chicks dig winners. As far as you losers are concerned, you're never gonna get the babes. That's the advice from the resident doctor at the Heart Attack Grill in Las Vegas. Let's hear a bit more from him, shall we? A lot of doctors will prescribe exercise, vegetables, and all kinds of healthy things. We do just the opposite. We prescribe fun. And while I do agree that enjoying yourself and having fun is vital for your health, I'm not sure that stuffing your face with food that's going to make your body literally shut down can really be constituted as fun. Generally, eating like this seems to do a disservice to your body and your mind. The only thing that may benefit is your clout. And in the end, is that worth it? It's totally normal for people to go through highs and lows. That's a part of being a human being. But for me, these highs and lows were starting to last more than just a day. They were starting to last a few days. So when I would go into these low points, I would start to feel very, like almost like I was a different person. To conclude, I'm gonna quote some of the articles I'd mentioned throughout the video. Dietitian Ariane Lang said, it's shedding light on a world where indulgence takes center stage and the human body bears the brunt of its consequences. Journalist Scott Detrow said, eating is one of the great psychic preoccupations of our species. It's right up there with sex and death. I mean, eating is this animal act that we all participate in to some degree, and this is the most animal version of it, but it's happening in an environment where there are safety rules. So in a sense, it's like this display of gluttony that has been kind of made safe for you to look at and think about. That's like this pane of safety glass between you and the danger. 
He goes on to say that this sport symbolizes the outsized American appetite for everything. Resources, power, money, you name it, bro. Where health is concerned, it's pretty difficult to argue for the safety of competitive eating, even with the precautionary measures in place. Though the sport related risks may not seem as obvious as say an ACL injury, it's hardly all fun and games. If you get nervous, just picture the audience naked and slide those hot dogs down your throat. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to subscribe and give it a big thumbs up to feed the algorithm. And if you're already subscribed, make sure that YouTube didn't unsubscribe you from the channel because they sometimes do that. We're working towards 700,000 subs and we would love to have you with us on that journey. If you don't like the video, be sure to let us know why in the comments section down below. I read as many comments as I can and we use your feedback to make our videos better for you. And don't forget to follow my gym, Human 2.0 Fitness, for free right here on YouTube, where we post content that helps you move better and prevent injury. And if you simply want to support the channel, then consider becoming a member, bro. Otherwise, as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho, where we see one, do one, teach one.